What is going on, Renegade family? Hey, this is Johnny hanging out with you today, and I am super excited not only to share what God has put uh, into my heart for you guys as um, part of the Renegade movement, part of the Renegade family, but I just want to start off by doing this. Can we pray? And the reason why I say can we pray is because we are about to um, journey as, as we are literally just a couple weeks away from Easter, and that is the, you know, one of the most amazing stories that we get to share. So I just want to take a moment as we're going to reflect upon uh, a, a very intimate uh, event that happened between Jesus and his disciples today. I just want to take this moment and to pray. So if you guys will join with me. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are present with us, that you are uh, active and you are changing the world as we know it and you change it in such a weird and unique way in that um, it's little conversations it is uh, things that we may at first think well that's a coincidence as C.S. Lewis put it I believe in a lot of coincidences meaning he believed and he was trying to express that when I pray and then I see things happen that's not a coincidence. That is the fact that there is a relationship between us and God and that God is changing and transforming the future as we see it because of the fact that we're choosing to pray, that we're choosing to basically co-labor with God in forming the future. And we do that now. So Jesus, we give you this time. We give you this conversation. Uh, we give you our hearts. We give you our imaginations. We give you everything of us to you as an act of worship, as a, as a way of saying we love you, Jesus. So um, we pray this in Jesus' name, right? Amen. So <laughs> I, I want to take you guys on a little bit of a journey and possibly a journey that you may have already taken. Maybe you've already read this passage of scripture. Um, but as we kind of talk about what is going on, the fact that we're going towards Easter, the fact that, you know, a week from now will probably be uh, um, Palm Sunday and we need to unpack all that and what it looks like. But as we are getting closer to that time, I want to take the opportunity to do the very thing um, that John did with his, this, you know, with his uh, gospel, ultimately describing what he got to experience as a disciple. And that is, if you guys read the gospel of John, you'll find out that um, his whole gospel is, is, you know, the story of Jesus. Obviously, it's, it's on its own understanding. Like, as a theologian, he wrote things that just blow your mind that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not write. So, he has his own category, and as he starts to describe his experience of Jesus, the one-on-one -on -one experience that he had, um, halfway through his gospel, he slows everything down. So unlike the other gospels that you know kind of tell the story of what Jesus did, and then towards the end of the book, then you start to get the crucifixion and that kind of stuff. No, John literally is like the week prior to Jesus dying, that takes up an entire half of his gospel. And so this is one of those moments where we're looking at literally days prior to Jesus, uh, you know, going to the cross and, and, and sacrificing his life for us. Right before that, he has this moment. And the reason why I want to highlight this specific event is because I, I want to speak to, um, to you as a disciple, as somebody who's following Jesus. But then I also want to speak to those who maybe you're in leadership. Maybe you're thinking about starting a church plant somewhere. Or maybe you have been following us, uh, uh, my wife Ashley and I, through this, this journey of transition of, of ultimately having a dream within our hearts, but then never, never actually doing anything with it. And, and now where everything is chaotic, where everything is, uh, you know, you, you would think that I will, you know, it's, it's a good idea to start a project when everything is, is good and everything's organized. And, you know, there's nothing that you're necessarily worrying about. Um, that's not where we are right now. And it's beautiful and, and strange at the same time. So I just want to share that with you guys. Let's take this moment and really reflect upon, you know, what, what is the church all about? Why are we here as disciples of Jesus? And ultimately, what example do we have that we find within Jesus himself? I want to ask you guys this question. Have you ever, 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 um, assumed anything 
we have right and, and and i know there's a quote that goes with it that never assume because it makes yeah out of you and me so whatever the case is here's something where we're about to collide with a cultural assumption something that that maybe the disciples talked amongst themselves or maybe it was just a, an understanding they may have had and then it collides with reality assumption and reality will always collide together and one has to win right so I want to kind of guide you guys through this. If you guys have your Bibles, of which I would encourage you in this moment, grab your Bible. If this is on your phone, you know, you can look at your Bible app, whatever the case is. Grab a pen, grab, a, you know, a, a journal or something. I want to encourage you guys. These are simple things, but very important to your spiritual life and growth. It is very important that you guys try, just try. Uh, to journal things because then you get to look back and see what God has done. So in this case, let's take a little journey with John as he prepares, reflecting upon the last week of Jesus, looking at John 13, starting with verse 1 all the way um, to about 16, uh, oh, sorry, 18, and we'll kind of reflect upon this. So now before the feast of of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world and to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Hmm. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper he laid aside his outer garment taking a towel tied it around his waist when he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him he came to simon peter who said to him lord do you wash my feet jesus answered him what i am doing you do not understand now but afterward you will understand Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If you do not, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And we'll kind of look at that in a second. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but it is but he is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you remember or do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so am I. But if then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, and we'll talk about that in a second as well, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scriptures will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place. And when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me, the one who sent me. Here we have a beautiful moment just, just prior to the Passover meal. Jesus is having a meal with them. Now I know... I'm sorry, guys, but as as a <laughs> as a disciple and as a scholar, I need to let you know in on a few secrets. Okay, well, for one, John is very specific when he says just a, it was before the Passover meal. Christian tradition normally puts this event as happening at the Passover meal, but there is a chronological issue. There is a possibility that this isn't the Passover meal, but rather right prior to the Passover meal. Maybe a meal that they had a day before, or maybe it was the meal itself, but not the Passover meal. Maybe this was just some time before. Whatever the case is, it doesn't change a whole lot of theology. It just simply changes time. 
So here we have Jesus hanging out with his disciples. And it, it is normal, like you and I probably think, okay, we're sitting at the table, right? Well, you have a raised table and then you have benches or chairs and we're all sitting, you know, the normal type. That's not what's going on. In Jesus's culture, it is normal for you to recline. And when I say the word recline, I mean like you have one elbow on the table and the table, by the way, is probably four or five feet off of the ground. It's not very tall. It's intended for you to lean on and then your feet should be hanging out behind you. So it, it is kind of like a kind of like when you lean up against, let's say, a couch, right? You're sitting on the floor, but you're leaning on the couch, maybe talking to a friend or your spouse or whatever the case is. That's the idea of what's going on. So here you have 12 men that are surrounding this table. Jesus is at it too. And everyone's kind of leaning on in and their feet are extended out behind them. Now you understand why this event would be so simple and so easy. But we have to stop here and understand what exactly is going on. Here we have a description of Jesus, and there's two words that Jesus starts to describe <clears throat> and ultimately talk to his disciples. He says, you call me teacher, Rabboni, right? Rabbi, that's, that's a title, yes. He says, you call me teacher, Rabbi. You also call me Lord, Adonai. Interesting. Because <clears throat> on the one hand, you have them calling him teacher, which kind of offended Jesus. I'm going to be honest. Many times whenever Jesus was called teacher, he did not like the title because they were ultimately robbing him of his actual title, which is Messiah and Lord, Adonai. But here we have the... Cre <laughs> Let me put it this way. Look at the universe that you see. As, as my wife and I oftentimes share with one another, we love saying this to each other, I love you as big as the known universe. There is more to our universe. We just don't know about it. So imagine as big as our known universe is. Jesus is the creator of all of this, being God. And by the way, I'm not going to assume that I'm just talking to Christians. I may be, you may be watching this because you have a Christian friend that has decided to say, hey, uh, check out this guy. He had an awesome conversation and you are a non-believer. You, you don't even know who Jesus is. Maybe you've heard about him, but you want to know more. I want to take this opportunity to address you and say, hey, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Because now we can dialogue, now we can talk, now we can have, you know, who is Jesus? So here, here's something that we need to understand. The Bible tells us that Jesus is God. Being God, that means that God created the whole universe, right? So the, the known universe that we know, that is, a, that is what Jesus has made. Okay, so he's the one that has created and sustains it all. Not only that, he's created every cell that is in your body. Try to wrap your head around that. On a molecular level, like <laughs> the littlest elements and, and, and neuron, yeah, neuron, but if it's like an electron, a proton, like the atoms, this is to the level by which God has created. He's created everything that we know and he sustains and holds everything that we know. You would think that if, if God were to show up in human form, he would be like bedazzled. He would have, you know, everything gold, silver from top to bottom. He would be wearing a crown, holding a scepter, like he would come in power. He would just be, you know, not showing off, but in essence showing that he's God, right? You would think this, this is what we would, you guessed it, assume. That this would be, if you're going to be a deity, if you're going to be a God, this is how you show up as a God. But what ends up happening is that Jesus is reclining at table. And he takes the opportunity to do something. He ultimately removes his outer garment. So it would be like his shirt, his tunic. And then he puts a towel around his waist. That right there is where we need to stop. Why is this so significant? Because this is only a role that a servant, and not only just a servant. If we were to dive into Jewish culture, it is literally documented by other scholars and, and other uh, scribes and Pharisees that said, you know, in, in kind of conversation with one another, and they, they would write it down. Listen, um, washing feet is not even, not even okay for a Jewish slave. In fact, they would tell one another, that is for a Gentile slave, meaning you are not a believer. You're not part of the family of God. Jews were only part of the family of God. A Gentile, meaning a non-believer, they could do something like that. That's how low 
and how ridiculous of a role it is for someone to wash another person's feet. It's expected of the slave in the room. It's expected and okay even, and please understand, I mean this culturally, not referring to now, but this was something that maybe, maybe women and children would be allowed to do. Because that was their view of, of people back in the day. Here, Jesus wraps a towel around his waist and he puts water in a basin. And I want you guys to understand what these feet look like. No, it's not like you and I, oh, I took off my shoes. Please, my feet stink. It's embarrassing. Oh, no, 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 no. That is nothing compared to you have been walking around in dirt. You have been <laughs> walking around in in. Uh, you know, animal feces, because animals don't clean up after themselves. They go where they want to go. You're walking in the same streets. So imagine your feet are caked with that nastiness and dirt and mud and whatever else you tracked in. Ultimately, that is the grossest part of your body because you've walked in everything, everything. And here we have Jesus who then takes a basin and washes every single one of their feet. Scholars believe that Peter is actually the oldest disciple. And by oldest, I actually mean older than Jesus, which would explain why he often rebukes him and tries to like put him in his place, right? Because he's young, he's dumb, he doesn't know anything. Oh, Peter. Peter takes the opportunity and as we read this, it says, so... Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter and and Simon said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Peter is upset. Like there's literally like this, this snarling kind of like, what are you doing? Don't you dare. You're not. Why? Because he's, he is in fact the honored one at the table. And in their hearts, they know that he is the Messiah. They've confessed it before. But this kind of Messiah? This is the kind of person you're going to show yourself to be? See, now we're uncomfortable. Now we're uncomfortable because we can actually handle deity. We can handle God because the image or the thought of God that we have in our heads and in our hearts is that he is so holy and so different and so out there. We can handle it. Why? Because he's out there and we're here. But what does Jesus do? Wrapping a towel around his waist. He just took God from being out there to now here, right here, touching your feet. That's too close, God too close. Simon tells him, you're not, you're not washing my feet. That is inappropriate. And it's very inappropriate of you of all people to do the act of what you are doing because this is a dishonorable act. Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you would understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. At this point, guns are out. (laughs) Like Peter's made it clear. Obviously, you didn't understand me the first time. You will not be doing this to me. Jesus answered, and I love this about Jesus, because if you want to fight with him, guess what? He will fight you. He will. He is sarcastic at times. He does rebuke. He does, in fact, sometimes turn the tables on you. In this case, he does it to Simon Peter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, you, sh- you, know, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if, you, if, if I do not wash you, you will have no share with me. Interesting the word share. What does share mean? This is a reference of... Again, looking at John, the one who is penning this, who is the gospel writer, this is a reference to the end times. This is a reference to the kingdom that is a weird kingdom because it's not here and yet it's here. It's the kingdom to come and yet is present at the same time. What is Jesus saying to Simon? Simon, if you will not let me serve you and clean you, that's the beauty of it. If you will not let me clean you, then you will not have part in this kingdom. Not in the present 
or the one to come. Wow. I don't know about you, but I feel like the, the rug just got pulled from underneath me. It's like, well, now I have nowhere to stand on. Fine. What is Peter's response? The same thing you and I would have done. And he goes, okay. If <laughs> Peter said to him, um, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and, and my head. Okay, well, now, now you're, going, <laughs> you're overzealous on this thing. Yes, he tells Peter, listen, Peter. Um, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he is completely clean. Why only the feet? Because the feet is the dirtiest, nastiest part of you. I want you guys to understand that the love of Jesus will always reach the worst part of our soul. Yes, we can get overzealous sometimes and say, well, take all of me. (laughs) Yes, but the journey begins in the brokenness. The journey of, and here's, here's, here's the kicker. The journey begins with allowing Jesus to serve us. That's something that we fight him on every single time. Why? Because that makes him too close. But he has stated it and he'll tell us the exact same thing. If you will not let me serve you with forgiveness grace and love you can't have any part of this kingdom can we take a moment and before we we continue reading i want you to notice who's in the crowd yes we have peter we have john we have the other disciples some of them we don't even remember their names but there's one judas he's mentioned at the beginning John made it very clear that in the moment, Satan had already inspired uh, Judas to betray Jesus. It, you have to wonder, what does it take for a human soul to listen to the whispers of a serpent? That ultimately the only answer you come up with is someone has to die. Wow. But we do that all the time. Whenever we get upset with someone, whenever we get frustrated with someone, whenever we feel that they have wronged us or, or they deserve X, Y, and Z, what are we ultimately deciding? They are less human than I am. Therefore, I can pull a judgment call and say they don't deserve to live. It's crazy that our human souls can do that. But they do. That, my beloved renegades, is the ugliest part of our soul. That is one of the many places that Jesus wants to meet us. That is where Jesus wants to wrap a towel around his waist. And that is where he wants to clean. But I want you to highlight one thing. Jesus still washed his feet. He didn't skip Judas. He washed his feet. Now, just because Jesus has cleaned his feet doesn't mean that Judas is with the rest of them. In fact, it says he knew who was going to betray him. He knew that he was going back to the Father. And by the way, we have to stop and rewind this entire thing. Why? Because how can Jesus wrap a towel around his waist and go to the disciples and do such a thing as serving them to this capacity? Because he knows who he is. According to the first few verses of chapter 13 of John, it says he knew he was from the Father and that he was returning to the Father. And he came here to show one thing and only one thing, love. And the reason why I scream that is that today in our churches and the things that we're focusing on, we're constantly focusing on how can we better ourselves in Fill in the blank, whether it's being a better father or husband or or mother or or child or daughter or son. And we so focus on, you know, I want to I want a prophetic word for me. I want to know God's will for me and I want to be served and I want to go to a church where I feel like I liked the sermon and I liked the worship and I liked the whatever. And then they gave me a gift and it was a cool cup with the logo on it. How are you doing in love? Because the only thing here 
The main one thing that Jesus taught us, and in this moment, the most epic, intimate moment. What is Jesus doing right before he's about to go to the cross? It says that he loved his own and he loved them to the end. Folks, what is written right here is that Jesus was trying to get us to do one thing and do it well. Love. And in fact, love so hard that we wash our enemy's feet. You know what just troubled the disciples? Ultimately, the thing that finally was just the last stab right there was when Jesus says, You call me Lord and teacher. And I am. That's my rightful title. But here's the deal. If you're Lord of the universe and teacher of all things, the secret things of God, if that is who I am, look at me. I have a towel wrapped around my waist. If this is how I show you love, if this is how I show up in this story, then you do likewise. And then he has the audacity to ask him to do the number one thing that was so beyond inappropriate. Not just the fact that he's washing their feet, but it's the fact that Jesus said, now, wash each other's feet. You know that they looked around at each other going, are you kidding me? No, like, what are you doing? You are destroying social norms right now. Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Are you with me? That is what Jesus chose to describe and to show himself to us as the one who has a towel wrapped around his waist. How did Jesus choose to show us love? Not by condemning, not by calling us out, not by doing anything to remind us of our brokenness. No, in fact, what he did was he showed us our truest value by looking at us in our eyes and wrapping a towel around his waist and cleaning the filthiest part of us. Where does this all culminate to? The greatest gift that we will ever be given. Forgiveness in Jesus dying for us. Why? Because of love. I want you guys <clears throat> to take this moment and ask yourself this question. Have I, in fact, embraced the love that Jesus has for me? I know that you, you thought you, you, you walked into the loophole, okay? Because if God is love, then he has to love you. Like, what other option does he have? He's love, right? As strange as this is going to sound, I want you guys to think of it this way. Yes, he does love you. But I need you to understand that he also likes you. He delights in you. You make him happy. The reason where I'm getting this, because it's not good to just come up with cute little fuzzy ideas that make us feel better. No, no, no. Things have to be rooted in Scripture. When Jesus was baptized by his cousin John and the, the universe that we know ripped open and the Holy Spirit came down on him in the form of a dove and rested on him and then like bellowing from the universe, he hears the Father's voice, you are my son and you make me happy. Other translations say in you I am well pleased. If this is how the Father talks to the Son, and then Jesus prays in the book of John, Father, as you have loved me, now I have loved them. And I pray that they would then love each other and love me and love you. Have you in fact heard the voice of God saying your name? On his lips. Saying I love you. And I like you. And you make me proud. And you make me happy. If you've never ever known Jesus. 
And right now, you're sitting there going, I don't know how this is making sense, but it's making sense <laughs> in here and in here. And I, I want to take this moment to give everything that I have to, to this Jesus that is saying my name and telling me, I love you, I care about you, I like you, and you make me happy. I would suggest that you surrender your heart and your mind to him right now. That you would tell Jesus, Lord, have all of me. Talk to him. He's been listening to you his whole life. There's no special incantation. There's no special words. You don't even have to like read the Bible yet. You'll get there. But just to say, Jesus, be the guy in charge of my life. Or as Christianese likes to say, be the Lord of my life. Have you allowed Jesus to embrace and love you well? Have you surrendered the fight and just given in to his love? And then I'm going to ask you another question. What does your love life look like? And no, I'm not asking about your dating life. I'm asking you, how do you love others? Do you do well? Do you need help? Do you feel like you could do better? <laughs> you want to take it another notch? How are you doing loving your enemies? That one's, that one's hard. So do me a favor. Can we do this together? Like you and me and, and, and everyone else in this family, this renegade family. Let's do this together. So Jesus, I pray right now as we are closing this time of just spending time with you and learning from you. And we haven't even fully unpacked this passage. And maybe at another later time we can. But, but we are about to walk into Palm Sunday. And so, Lord, I pray this is, this is beautiful because now we get to venture into another part of the story and understand what's going on. But Jesus, we don't want to rush this. So in this moment, will you teach us and show us how to mimic towel wearing? Because this world needs more towel wearers. It doesn't need another fancier name or logo or, or celebrity preacher or, or another. It just needs more towel wearers. So will you make us as renegades, wherever we are, whatever church we're involved in, whatever community we're in, whatever job we have, will you teach us to wear a towel? Will you teach us to serve our bosses, our co-workers? Will you teach us to serve our family, our daughters and sons? Will you teach us to serve one another as husband and wife? Or will you teach us to serve our friends if we're single and just living life right now? Will you teach us to wrap towels around our waist even if we're walking with a cane or maybe can't see well anymore? Will you teach us to wrap our towels around us as we visit those who are in prison or maybe visit those who are in hospitals? Teach us to wear towels. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.